Greetings, everybody. It's Ian from RTO here. Welcome to another Saturday special. And as you can see, I'm not on my own today. I've got Richard again, all the way from Ireland. Hello, Richard. How you doing, Ian? Great to be here again with you. Yeah, as we've just spoke off air, what a crazy few days. Um, I know. It's heartbreaking. Just heartbreaking. Um, I've just what well, I've just watched that the session thing, and it was just amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. um anyway what we're here for today is that um we talked to, we've talked about our next show and we're going to pick our favorite number ones from the 1970s now i've gone away from what i normally do like slade and t-rex and that because it'd just be a show full of them so i've gone a bit different and i know richard has gone he's just stuck with his top favorites but he's not repeated himself so as usual, Richard starts, I follow, and we've got some bubbly numbers because I've got a few, and I'm sure Richard has. Yes. So shall we start, folks? Okay. Well, my number 10 is a number one hit from the end of September 1979, and it was number one for three weeks, and it is the police message in a bottle. No, I absolutely love this. I love the guitar riff of it. I think it's great. And I love the little yelps of Sting when he's singing it. It's just an absolutely brilliant, almost new wavy type song with a little tinge of reggae. Not as much as Walking on the Moon, but this is just an absolute classic single for me. And I love it. And it gets my number 10. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Richard. It was a, I mean, when that came out, it was something different. Yep. Uh, it still remains one of my favourite police songs of all time. It, it's just crack. I mean, Walking on the Moon is my favourite, but that is a very close second. It's a fantastic song. Yeah, it is actually, it's from the Regatta de Blanc album, and that's my favourite police album by... No, I can't remember. Not, 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 not a long way, because I do love the Zinjata Mandata album, but those two albums in particular are far ahead of the other three albums we did, for me anyway. I can't remember how I ranked them. I, I rank so many albums. I, just, I, I totally forget, and that's terrible, but I'll have to look it up and see where I'm going. So, right, my number one. Now, this goes back. No, yep. number 10, sorry. Sorry, it's just all confusing today. So, my number 10 comes from 1972, and it spent four weeks at the top of the charts. And it's a song that I remember as a child. So I'd have been about five. And it's Mouldy Old Doe by Lieutenant Pigeon. I, 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 I just don't know. I don't know because I was five years old. I did find something about this when I was doing some research. The piano bit is actually played by Steve Winwood's mum in I their front that. lounge. <laughs> I think in an upright piano as well. Yeah. I don't know why. I know. I, 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 it's just a fond memory of that. I love it as well. I've got the single, but it didn't make my list, but I do actually like it. Yeah, it's just that. Oh, old <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's all I, I can remember that. Now, I would have been five and remembering that, that is some feat. <laughs> yeah, my cousin had the single. That's how I knew it. And he only lived three doors up, so I got to hear it a lot. But uh, have you ever heard their follow-up, Desperate Dan, which got top ten? Yes, it's, it's actually very good as well. Yeah, as I, I'm, I'm really tempted to do a retro ranking on Lieutenant Pigeon just for the sheer hell of it, because their songs are just amazing. <laughs> well, okay, that's a, an odd choice, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> Right, my number nine, and it's a number one hit from 1971, uh, March 71, and it stayed at number one for six weeks. And you know I have to have this band in, and it's Hot Love by T-Rex. Um, this is the start of glam rock. Before he went uh, on, well, on stage and top of the pops to perform it, the uh, makeup artist put a little glitter teardrop under his eye. Glam rock was born. The, the cameras picked up on it, and then everyone went mad for glam rock. Now, I do understand and I do accept that it's a little bit of a rip off of Hey Jude with the la la la's at the end instead of the na na na's. 
but I actually prefer this. Um, I think it's a fantastic single. Now, in America, they did an edit of it where some of the la la la's they put in the middle of the song. And then they put a few more at the end and they reduced the time. This is nearly five minutes long to about slightly over three minutes. And it works as well. It's, it, the actual US version works as well. But this yeah, I've heard, I've heard the US version of that. And I was, and I thought, yeah, this does actually work. Yeah. Yep. Great choice. And um, as you know, this week, next week is the anniversary of the yes. passing. And yes, yes, we have got a special show on Retro Ranking. I know you have, and I'm looking forward to it. Oh, my. <laughs> so my number nine, we go back to the first year of the 70s, a song that was at number one for six weeks. It's Dave Edmonds, I Hear You Knocking. A song written by Dave Bartholomew and was released in 1955 by yeah. Smiley Lewis. Great version, but Dave really rocked it up. And like he does most of the songs that he covers. I mean, I love Dave Edmonds. Oh, I love Dave Edmonds as well. But this song is amazing. That that riff and that vocal on that song is just amazing. It's it still the firm, firm favourite for people today. And when you go in the pubs on a jukebox, someone is mm. going to put that on of any age. Yeah. Did you know... The Shake and Stevens and the Sunsets recorded it before Dave Edmonds. No. On their 19th album. And you should look it up YouTube. It's a different version. So it is a completely different version, but it's not bad. So it's not, but no, it's a really good choice. I think that was probably the best selling single of 70. I, I think it was. Yeah, I'm not going to quote, I'm, don't quote me on that, but I think it was. I know it was Christmas number one for that year. Yes. That was. So, yeah, no, another excellent choice. Well, my number eight, and you have to have a little bit of this band, and you know to expect this, Fernando by ABBA. Yeah. Now, okay, now, <laughs> let, let me say this. I loved the video for this. I fell in love with Frida, who has got the lead vocal in this by watching that video, and the song is just a beautiful, beautiful song, perfectly constructed, perfectly sung. Um, it's my favourite ABBA single, and I love all the ABBA singles, but this is the one that shines out for me. Um, I absolutely adore it. And it got to number one in 76 for four weeks. And this really, after, this was the follow-up to Mamma Mia, which got to number one as well. But this one was the one that really did... Um, this pushed the greatest hits album. Do you remember the greatest hits album yeah. where they're sitting on the park bench? Yeah. This was the most recent single from that. Uh, it, the, the cover of the album actually says featuring the number one hit, Fernando. And this really did elevate them in the UK. And it's my number eight. Yeah. Um, fond memories of that because my dad got that other album. And, uh, oh. you know, it was, it was constantly played in our house. Yes. So, and that, I think that's, I mean, we all watched Waterloo at the Eurovision Song Contest because that was in the days when we used to watch it because it was worth watching. And yeah, that song is great. It's got a lot of, it's got that Spanish Mexican feel to it. It's a really strong song. Really like one, that one. Okay. My number eight, we're going to 1973 now to a song that only was at the charts for two weeks, but it's a great song and it's Get Down, Gilbert O'Sullivan. Oh, I love that. I think it's great. Yeah, um, I've been listening to a little bit of him, and there's another song he talks about, The Cup of Tea, and I can't remember the full title, but it's a lovely song. Yeah, it is. Have you ever seen brilliant. people dance to it on top of the pops, but the dogs? Yeah. <laughs> taking, taking the lyrics too literally. <laughs> the thing with this song was, apparently, this is what I found out, he used it as a warm-up song. All right. And someone said to him, why don't you record it? Mm. And what a good choice it was, because it's a belter. It's got one of them catchy tunes. And what mm. I like about it, everyone knows the words. You know, mm. you, just, uh, you know, you you can't think them off the top of the head, but when that record comes on, you start singing it. You cannot help it. I mean, when I was listening to this, get this prep, prep for this, every time I put it on, I was singing it. Badly, yeah, but <laughs> but I had to sing it. That's what a number one hit does. It yeah, makes you sing. That's why it's number one. So no, another great choice. 
Okay, my number seven is from 1975, February, and it stayed two weeks at number one. And it's Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel, Make Me Smile, Come Up and See Me. This is almost like the perfect pop song. It's got great acoustic guitar with a fantastic acoustic guitar lead. You don't really hear an acoustic guitar lead, really, in most pop songs. And then it's got the ooh la la's. Now, I'm always a sucker for something like ooh la la's. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's just perfectly constructed and catchy as hell. And I love it. Um, it's my number seven. Right, I've just noticed in my script that the, um, the, the when it came out, it's not um, printed. So I'm going to have to revert to my original notes. <laughs> right, for my, my number seven... We go to 1972, a song that got to the top for three weeks. And it's a song by Chickory Tip, Son of My Father. Yeah. Now, that beginning bit, I think, was played on a stylophone. It may well have been, actually, don't I think you said. Because I had a stylophone, like most kids did. It was an easy instrument. Now, I've got a brother and dad that are musically gifted. I'm not. I'm the... But my dad <laughs> showed me how... Because he listened to it. You know, this was after. He said, oh, no, the, you will recognise this. Da, 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 da. And he told me how to play it. And it's one of the bits I can play of that song. I thought that song, though, was very... Before its time, because there was lots of keyboard sounds that weren't around in 1972. And it's an old song that was... Re written by Georgia Moroda, of all people. And he, it was done by a guy in Be um, Belgium, and um, German, called Nat Shing Don, sung by Michael Holm. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it, and it sounds nothing like it. <laughs> 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 but I do love this version. It is one of my favourite songs. Oh, I love it as well. I love the follow-up even more. What's your name? In fact, I do have a Chicory Tip album. They only had one album, so there's something for you, Ian, for the, the one album only series. Yeah, I'll get there. I think that is uh, a good one. But those two are the electronic songs. The rest of the album, it, it's, it's very acoustic and it just sounds of its time. But those two songs, uh, Son of My Father and What's Your Name, stand out with the electronics. It's one of the songs of the 70s, isn't it, really? It's got that embez. It, 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 in police, what's the word? It does emphasise the 70s. You hear that, and it remade it is the 70s. Okay, well, my number six is from 1971. It got to number one at the end of January. It stayed there for five weeks. That's George Harrison's My Sweet Lord. Now, I'm not religious or in any way or form, um, but I absolutely love this. I love the acoustic guitars of it. I love the the chanting and the hallelujahs of it. I just think it's an absolutely wonderful track. It's not his best ever song, though. It's my second favourite George Harrison song, solo song. The B-side, What Is Life, is my favourite George Harrison song. So we've got the best of both worlds here with My Sweet Lord and What Is Life. It's an absolutely brilliant song, deserved to get to number one. I couldn't see the Beatles recording it, and if they did, it would have been thrown on the B-side, which is a shame. But it's an absolutely wonderful track, and it gets my number six. Yeah, I mean, it came off a great album. Yep. Oh, all, it's very good. All, all, must, all Things Must Pass. It's just, it's, I mean, I, as you know, I reviewed it not so long ago, and it, it's a quintessential album to have. If you like rock, sort of, that sort of era, you've got to have it. It's, 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 there's no uh, other album you need. You need that one. Right, my number six. We go to 1976, a song that I remember coming out in the charts. And when I first heard it, I thought it was the Bay City Rollers. Now you, know, know, you know what's coming. But it wasn't. It was a song by a band called Slick, Forever and Ever, with a very young Midge Yore. And this, if you didn't know this, folks, this is the song the Bay City Rollers turned down. Yeah, that's correct. I don't understand why. It's a very good song. And it's written by Bill Martin and Phil Coulter, yeah. who wrote yeah. the 
early Bay City Rollers singles, but you will know that after the first album, they more or less ditched uh, Coulter and Martin and went for different songwriters. Yeah. The last one that Phil Coulter, I say Phil Coulter because he's a local guy, he's from uh, Derry in Northern Ireland and huge, huge big songwriter. You know, wrote things like Congratulations uh, for Cliff Richard, Puppet on the String for Sandy Shaw. And he did those basic roller singles. The last one he did was All of Me Loves All of You. And then they dumped them and they went with that. Uh, I can't remember the other songwriters for Bye Bye Love. Well, Bye Bye Love was an old Four Seasons song. Yeah. But I think yeah. like I Give a Little Love. And by that time, they were starting to not be as successful. Put it that oh, way. I mean, I, you know, the, the really early stuff, as you know, you know, is my favourite stuff. And they sort of went down the pan a little bit. But they they were absolutely bonkers to turn that song down. I re- it's, And I hope they regret it. <laughs> Uh, the funny thing is, that year had two number ones with the title Forever and Ever, because Demis Rossos had yes, one of them. Yes, he did. Yeah, so there you go. Yes. Right, my number five is um, a track, you won't be able to read this, but it's called Reason to Believe. But it's not Reason to Believe. This only got to number 30-something when it was released. And then the DJs switched it round and played the B-side called Maggie May yes. by Rod Stewart. And it got straight up to number one and stayed there for five weeks in 1971. This is Rod's best ever song. It is absolutely brilliant. I have one of the most played songs for me ever, and I've never, ever got sick of it. And I love the Top of the Pops performance with John Peel pretending to play the mandolin or whatever instrument it is. Of the ukulele, but this is fantastic. That's when Rod was really, really good as well. The Faces, he was still a member of the Faces. Yes, he was. And they were putting out some really good singles as well as albums. But um, yeah, Maggie May is my number five. And I do actually love the song Reason to Believe. It's an old Tim Harden song, and this is the best version of it as well. But I'm giving it to Maggie May. Yeah, some. Talking of uh, faces, I've got. I mean, my battle of the debuts this week is very unique because we've got. I've put the faces against the small faces. I saw that. That's yeah. ingenious. Same band, yeah. Same band with a few members missing. Yes. So um, a reinvention. So that's why that one's in there. But I totally agree. It's a great song. Um, I will be doing stuff on Rod Stewart like next year. Probably going to do something like the story of Rod Stewart, because there's so much that he was involved in musically people could get. So we're going to give a lot of love to Rod next year on the channel. Okay, my number five, we go to 1979 now, a song that was at number one for four weeks by a band called Tubeway Army. And it's Our Friends Electric. Yes, brilliant. Love it. If people really knew what that song was about, I think I don't know. you can you can inform us. Yeah, it's actually about electronic prostitutes. If oh, you goodness. read, if you read the lyrics, it's our friends electric. That's a question so, mark. At the end of it. Yes. Um, so, for those of you that get a bit, Whoa! that's what the song's about. And if you like it, you like it. And if you don't, oh dear. You're now going to go into freak mode, but it's a great song. Um, I love the, the fact that Gary Newman um, was experimenting with different keyboards. I mean, the story is that he he was somewhere in this keyboard. He had a play with it. He said, well, I like this. I'm going to use it. And he, I think he was the real first. He's the godfather of that new wave. He was using this. This was a... He was one of the godfathers that really emphasize this sound he went on to do it great when you know with his solo stuff but this song is always a firm favorite and people forget that it's tubeway army and not a gary newman song um it's great live i've seen live versions that he does now and he's still got the power to sing it. it's this great song i just love it i love it as well and you probably won't agree with me here but i do love the sugar babes freak, freak like me that sampled it i think it's sampled really well in that song but yeah, I mean, if you're going to sample something, sample a classic. Uh, 
and so, do it properly. And I, I'll give them the I'll give them their due. They sounded it properly, yeah. and they didn't muck it up. They kept it to its original sound. And fair play to them for doing that, and appreciate it and respect. Okay, we're getting into my top four. Um, these are all massive. It's uh, my number four, uh, released in 1977, got to number one for nine weeks. It's still the best selling single ever that has nothing to do with charity. And it's Mullet Kintyre. I love this. I don't care what anybody says. Um, I got to number one for a reason because it's that good. And whenever the bagpipes come on, I, I can feel the hairs of my arms standing up. I just absolutely yeah, love walking it. along that beach. Yeah, oh, it's a fantastic video. It really is. And it's one of these songs that if I'm playing in the car, I'll play it. And then I'll skip back to it again and play it again. It's one of the, I have to play it twice. Absolutely brilliant that song. Is, it is absolutely brilliant song. Totally agree with you. And we'll be talking about that a bit more soon. <laughs> anyway, my number four, we go to 1974, and it was um, a song that was at number one for four weeks, and it's Terry Jack's Season in the Sun. Song from my um, uh, childhood. Again, it's a Belgian song from 1963, and they yeah. read the words. There has been some rather dodgy versions of this, i.e. Westlife. That put me off a lot, but... Yeah, they absolutely caned it. It was horrible. I mean, we used to sing very rude songs at school. I mean, we was eight years old, you know. It was, you know, we have joy, we have fun, flicking bogeys at the sun. <laughs> the sun got too hot and the bogeys turned to snot, and that's like what we used to sing to it. But, that, you know, that is a song from my childhood. Was that written by Rod McEwen? Uh, yes. Was, I thought so, yeah. Uh, a a singer-poet. Oh, right, okay. Yes. But yeah, yeah choice. it's a classic. Absolute classic. It was a classic. Right, my number three, um, my top three are just three monster hits. And my number three is Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water, which got to number one for three weeks in 1970. And there's, let's show the picture of Art because he's the one that actually sings it. And his vocals on this are immense. They are totally immense. And when it goes into the last section of Seal on Silver Girl, the hairs in the back of my neck stand up. It's absolutely brilliant. I love the words. It's just a, a perfect, perfect love song. And it gets my number three. Okay, well, my number three is one we've already spoken about. It's Mulligan Tire Wings. Good stuff. It is a fantastic song. Again, it's the only thing I learned to play on the guitar, that opening. I can't play guitar, but apparently the opening chords are so simple, my dad said even I could play it. And he was right. It's the only thing I can play on the guitar. Dum, 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 and then the rest of it. But no, it was a great song. Or, you know... It's one of my favourite songs of the the decade, without a doubt. You know, that's why it's my number three. Well, well, my number two, and I have never got fed up with this either. And it's Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Ah! Uh, <laughs> now you may have got fed up with this. I do not know, but this actually has sold more now than uh, Mull of Kintyre because of the reissue and after Freddie's death. But those uh, sales were going to charity. So this is now a part charity single. But um, there's nothing you can say about this. It's just an absolute genius work. It really is. Um, I do love all sections of it. And I think it was very brave to release a song like this in 1975, you know, because it is like a mini opera. And, you know, this could have flunked you know, especially after the, the single before this was just the rock song, Now I'm Here, and then this comes out, but it gets to number one, it stays there for nine full weeks, and it's just magnificent, and well, that's my number two. Um, yeah, it's what a song, I mean, I do like it, don't get me wrong, I think it's a fantastic thing, and 
to be there when it came out like you we were we were there when it came in and it blew us away especially that video but as time has gone on if i never hear it again i will never get upset but i do appreciate the wonderful work that went into that song i mean i think in the film Bromine rhapsody it really encapsulates that and that bit i know is absolutely spot on when he just kept going to roger higher 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 yeah and there's a, 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 a an interview with roy thomas baker and he said he played there's freddie playing it on the piano and then he goes and he did a lovely impression and he goes well dears this is where the operatic comes in and roy thomas went oh my god <laughs> but it is absolutely brilliant um I don't I it's a song I don't really like but I do know that it is a classic okay my number two is from my favorite female singer ever four weeks at number eight in number eight no 1978 four weeks Kate Bush Wuthering Heights that's, that's an excellent choice excellent choice with with Kate Bush it's like Marmite you either like her or you hate her. I love her. I love everything that she's ever put out. And as an 18-year-old, uh, she was at the time, very, very um, ambitious. There's lots of people on there that have gone on to play in great bands. David Payton, Fish, Alan Parsons, mm. Morris Pert plays on it. You got great people and sort of production was done by David Gilmore, I think, in places. I'm, uh, I'm not sure who actually produced it. I know that uh, Gilmore promoted her a lot, but I'm not too sure exactly what he plays on it. No, but, but the drummer um, is Stuart Elliott, who featured on that Make Me Smile single. He was part of Cockney Rebel. Yeah, and the, the uh, guitar solo was played by Chatwood Ian Barninson. Who again played in the Alan Parsons project? No, uh, absolutely excellent choice. I'll be interested to see what your number one is. I can't think. <laughs> okay, my number one, and I'm going to, I've made this statement before. Not only is this the best number one single of the 70s, not only is this the best number one single ever, but this is the best ever single released ever. I can't phrase this highly enough. And it's Kate Bush, Wuthering Heights. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, uh, this is perfect. Whenever this came out, this was such a shock to the system because, you know, I've never heard a female or anybody sing in such a screechy high voice. And you thought, oh, God, this is terrible. And then you hear it a few times. And the underlying melody of this comes through. Then my brother bought the single and... It just gets better and better and better. Now, she did do a, a re of it in 1985. Yeah. Oh. I, I love it as well. So do, especially the end part, whenever she is really screaming. Yeah, really, you can tell her voice had uh, matured. It had matured a little, yes. Yeah, yeah, but like, it was only seven years between them. She was still in her, um, in her, in her 20s. So, yeah, this is my number one. Absolutely fantastic. And as you said... Four weeks at number one in 1978. Right. My number one is actually one you've spoken about. Ooh, right. Yeah. Okay. Bridge over troubled water. Oh, excellent. I thought you were too quiet whenever I was talking about bridge over troubled water. This is actually very, very special to me because it's the first song that I ever, ever remember. Ever. All right. My dad had the album so that album and this song are very very special to me it's my first memory of music and that love for this song and the album stayed with me forever and it probably will be one of my favorite songs ever because of that memory as like you say that sail on silverberg it's just amazing Yes, and that harmony with between Paul and Art is just fantastic. You see, a lot of people say that Paul Simon is not singing on that. I tend to disagree. 
because on the sale on Silver Girl, I believe his voice is there. Okay, he doesn't sound lead, but for a few of the, uh, for about five, ten seconds of it, I can hear his voice. Yes, he does. He's, he, he's right in that bit, that bit that your time has come. Yes. He, he's definitely on there. I think so as well. But yeah, per, uh, perfect choice. Well, we've just had the 10 minute warning come up. So we've only oh, got the okay. honorable mentions, folks. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> So right. you do yours straight away. I will. I'm going to go. Um, I'm I'm doing four. I'm cheating. Well, you can cheat. I'll let you. One, one I don't have as a single. I'm going to have to show the LP. Okay. You're the one that I want. John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. I love it. Absolutely brilliant. Again, another nine weaker at number one. Brilliant. Uh, and then we have uh, a guy that you talked about earlier with Chicory Tip. But this time it's Donna Summer and I Feel Love, written by Giorgio Moroder. And this is way, way ahead of its time. So it is. And my third one is Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd, which I actually like this single because it has an introduction to this song where the album doesn't. You know, it, it uh, sort of segues into the previous piece. So this was number one for about four weeks and the last number one single of the 70s. Yes. And then I'm going to show this. And this is what I would probably call my guilty pleasure, number one. And it's the new Seekers. I'd like to teach the world to sing. I think the harmonies on this are beautiful. I think it's just a gorgeous little song. Yeah, we all remember it from the Coca-Cola ad. Uh, so yes. <laughs> I absolutely love it, and I still love it. Um, this is one of my bubbling wonders. My well, honourable mentions, then. Um, this song is from 1975, three weeks at number one, Whispering Grass. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Donna Stahl and Windsor Davis. I love the programme. I just love that song. Oh, I love the programme as well, but no... Yeah, I, it's just it's just probably that I'll remember. And my nan had an album of the. Yeah. There was an album out, and that was one of the songs on it, and it got to number one. Okay, then we go further back from my next one to 1971, and another song I remember as a very small child. Hey, girl, don't bother him. The towns. I like that. I think that's yeah. pretty good. It's an old song from the 60s, written by Ray Whiteley. It, and it became a really big hit in the um, played it in the clubs as well. And Tams did it, and it's another one of them songs from my childhood that I absolutely adore. And my last one, because I've only got three, they go to 1979, one week. The Buggles video killed the radio star. Brilliant. That very was very close to getting into my. Uh... Bubbling Unders as well. Absolutely love it. Fantastic song. Great production, obviously. Trevor Horn. Yes. Jeffrey Downs, who's a, a magical keyboard player. I mean, he's done Asia. He's now in Yes. I mean, Trevor Horn's work with Yes. Two great blokes and a great song. Apparently, there was another version of that that featured um, Bruce Woolley. And Thomas Dolby. Oh, wasn't aware of that. No, it, it came out at the same time. But that one didn't do anything. Yeah. That just and it's, all, it's also very famous for being the first song played on MTV. Yes. It so, is. It's very catchy. It's which is weird song. because it came out in 79 and I think MTV was 1981. So yeah. it was two years old. So, no, fantastic song. Love it the bits. Absolutely love it the bits. Well, there we are, folks. Ian and Richard's number the ones of um, 1970s. And the good news is, at some stage, we'll be doing the 1980s. Yes, we will. Yes, which will be an interesting well, I, I find that much more difficult, actually. I think uh, the 70s were... The 70s is my favourite decade for music. I do love the 80s as well. But yeah. I think quality yeah. in the 70s is higher. Well, once again, Richard, it's always a pleasure, um, a pleasure. working with you on these. And we have become people, have you ever, all the remarks we get, people just love our 
interaction, which is very good, isn't it? We, you know, we, we, you know, we're getting famous as a dynamic duo now. <laughs> so that's all for today, folks. Um, once again, thank you very much, Richard, for joining us. And uh, we'll be back. I'll be back on Monday. What have I got for you, Monday? Captain Beefheart, which is a which is a struggle for me. That was a viewer's request. And we've got John Lennon Double Fantasy as the classic album. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great weekend, whatever you're doing. And it's bye for me. Oh, it's bye for me. Bye for now. <laughs>